1950, the year of the great mud bath. Take a look at that swamp. Kenny Blaine pitches out to Dennis Mendick, who slipped away from Pete Newman. Tackled by Ralph Wilson, who creates... 25, the 30, the 35, the 40. And... Zuger appears out of the fog. Warren in pursuit. Miller prevents a score at the one. <laughs> strategy works with an over-the-shoulder strike. At the turn of the century, sports fans couldn't count on channel surfing to take them around the continent. Live and in color meant that they braved the elements to witness their favorite games, and according to legend, the highest ranking government officials in Canada were no exception. As the story goes, Lord Earl Grey would quietly slip away from his duties as Governor General to witness rugby games on nearby pitches. Whether or not he was playing hooky doesn't really matter to the countless football fans in Canada and now the United States who watch the annual skirmish for a trophy that bears his name. The first was played in 1909 when the University of Toronto defeated Parkdale at Toronto's Rosedale Field. The Grey Cup was late in arriving for the game, and although U of T didn't receive the new trophy till the following year, it has since arrived on time to become the object of heated battles and raging controversies. At first, only teams from Eastern Canada competed for the Grey Cup, but that changed in 1921 when an Edmonton team transformed the contest into an East-West battle. Now, in 1995, the Grey Cup is North-South, pitting international rivals from Canada and the U.S. And that brings different regions of a continent together in not only a sporting spectacle, but also a flag-waving cultural event. In 1948, after the Stampeders went through an undefeated season and qualified for the Grey Cup, thousands of Westerners headed east to Toronto and partied hard, riding horses through hotel lobbies and flipping flapjacks on the steps of City Hall. Easterners got a taste of the West, and Grey Cup teams took on a personality often associated with the cities in which they resided. The great Tiger Cat teams of the 50s and 60s featured a ferocious defense reflecting the gritty steel town image of Hamilton. The Edmonton Eskimo dynasty of the late 70s and early 80s featured a defense called Alberta Crew. Not for their table manners, but the black goal that's made the province famous. In 1994, BC Lion fans cheered wildly as a hometown kid kicked the winning field goal with no time showing on the clock. On the team's 40th anniversary, in his 40th year, Louis Pisaglia booted the winning points after growing up in the shadow of Empire Stadium, his team's old turf. Even before U.S. expansion began in 93, the Grey Cup has included legends known to football fans north and south of the border. Joe Theismann, Warren Moon, Joe Cap and Bud Grant all guided their teams in championship play. And unlike Lord Earl Grey, fans didn't have to be in the host city to take in the action. Grey Cup parties became a tradition each November as people across Canada gathered around the radio and then the television set to get in on the action. In 1952, 43 years after Lord Earl Grey donated the trophy, Fans in Toronto were able to tune in to CBLT after the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation paid the Canadian Rugby Union, forerunner of the CFL, $7,500 to televise the game between the Toronto Argonauts and the Edmonton Eskimos. The Argos had been a powerhouse in the 1940s, winning three straight Grey Cups from 1945 to 47, and another in 1950 
in what is known as the Mud Bowl for the slippery conditions at Varsity Stadium, Toronto. In 1952, the Argos would beat Edmonton to win a record 10th Grey Cup, but it would be a long time before they captured another. The television rights ballooned to over $20,000 as three stations carried the 1953 Grey Cup between the Tiger Cats and the Blue Bombers. Grey Cup Week also got a brand new tradition to add to the festivities as the Shenley Awards were introduced to recognize the outstanding players in the country. Former Heisman Trophy winner Billy Vessels of the Eskimos was the first recipient of the most outstanding player award. Winnipeg had a player whose impact on football north and south of the border would be felt for years to come. Not only did Bud Grant play for and coach the Bombers, he also led the NFL's Minnesota Vikings to four Super Bowl appearances. In the 1953 Grey Cup game, it was Hamilton who struck first with a quarterback sneak by Ed Songman. But Winnipeg countered with a Jerry James plunge to tie the score before the Ticats took a 12-6 lead they would never relinquish with a 50-yard pass and run from Songen to Vito Regazzo. As the final play loomed, the game appeared to be headed to overtime as Winnipeg quarterback Indian Jack Jacobs passed to Tom Casey on the Hamilton one. But just as the throw hit Casey's hands, Winnipeg's Lou Cousero's hit shook the ball loose. Even in defeat, Jacob set great cup passing records, completing 28 of 46 passes for 326 yards. 1954 was the first time Edmonton had met Montreal in a Grey Cup showdown, but it wouldn't be the last. Over the season, Edmonton had replaced coach Darrell Royal with Frank Pop Ivy and installed the twin fullback offense featuring Normie Kwong and Johnny Bright, who had just been acquired from Calgary. But in the big game, it was another newcomer, Jackie Parker, known as Old Spaghetti Legs, who scooped up a Montreal Alouette fumble with less than four minutes left. He returned it 90 yards for a touchdown. For three years in a row, Edmonton would battle the powerful Alouettes three consecutive times. In the first Grey Cup ever to be played in Western Canada, 40,000 jammed Empire Stadium in Vancouver to watch the 1955 game, won 34-19 by Edmonton after trailing 19-18 at halftime. It was rushing versus passing with Montreal's Sam the Rifle Echeverry completing 30 of 39 passes for a record 508 yards. The Eskimos countered with a new rushing record of 440 yards led by Kwong and Bright who added two touchdowns each. Don Getty, who would become Premier of Alberta, quarterbacked the final Grey Cup victory of the Eskimo dynasty in 1956. Getty and Bright had a touchdown apiece, but Parker scored three plus a single to set an individual scoring record with 19 points in the 50-27 Edmonton victory. While the Edmonton-Montreal Grey Cup rivalry ran out of steam, a new rivalry was brewing as Hamilton and Winnipeg squared off in the 1957 Grey Cup at Varsity Stadium in Toronto. Over the next nine years, the two teams would clash six times in the Grey Cup, with Winnipeg winning four of those games. But it was the Tiger Cats who prevailed in the first meeting, winning 32-7 in the first nationally televised Grey Cup ever, with 31 stations carrying the game live. In Bud Grant's Grey Cup debut as coach, Winnipeg outdueled the Tiger Cats offensively, but the Bombers' downfall was turnovers. Hamilton recovered five fumbles. On that happy highway to the Bombers goal line, going all the way for the touchdown that throws the Grey Cup game wide open. Needing only one foot for a first down, Jerry James goes all out behind Herb Gray's block. Pete Newman pulls the ball from James, and Bibble's Bobble recovers for the Tiger Cats. And the Bombers have been shot down again. In 1958, the Canadian Football Council changed its name to the Canadian Football League and the birth of the CFL coincided with what some call the greatest game ever played. Oh, I don't think there's much doubt about it. It was a game in Vancouver between Hamilton and uh, Winnipeg, 1958. Uh, the Tiger Cats had, had beaten Ham Winnipeg rather handily the year before in Toronto, and they went to, to Vancouver. They were a very arrogant group, and Jim Trimble, their coach, said, we'll waffle them. I mean, uh, they thought they would win easily, and uh, it turned out to be, it was an, a wonderful football game. Uh, Hamilton, uh, Ralph Goldston, uh, 
their defensive back, their star defensive back, was thrown out of the game for punching Leo Lewis, and it's the first time I can remember ever seeing anybody thrown out of a Grey Cup game. But it uh, came down, actually, the final play of the game. Uh, Winnipeg were ahead 35-28. Bernie Filoni went back to pass. He had Harry Lampman wide open, and uh, Steve Patrick, uh, a middle guard, for, as we called him in those days, and the father of James Patrick, the NHL defenseman, he rushed through, hit Filoni's arm, the ball flew up in the air, Norm Rauhaus intercepted, and that was the end of the game. Amazing, I can remember that as clear as if they played it yesterday. I can remember more about that game than I think last year's game. Ridiculous, isn't it? The bomber Ticat rivalry continued into the 1959 season. Hamilton and Winnipeg met for the third straight time at a new Grey Cup site, Toronto's newly opened Exhibition Stadium. After a win each in the two previous Cup games, Winnipeg won the tiebreaker 21-7 in a game that was hampered by muddy conditions. In 1960, the Winnipeg-Hamilton rivalry was derailed as the Eskimos returned to the Grey Cup at Empire Stadium with legends Kwong and Bright leading the attack. Their opposition was not Montreal this time, but a team that had two quarterbacks who would dominate the CFL over the next two decades. CFL Hall of Famer Russ Jackson is generally regarded as the greatest Canadian quarterback to play the game. While Ron Lancaster, now the head coach of the Edmonton Eskimos, had set many career passing records himself. Passing, however, was not the story in this contest, as the Ottawa Rough Riders outrushed the Eskimos, and Ron Stewart's 99 yards was more than the entire Eskimo team could muster. And even offensive lineman Kay Vaughn got in on the act by scoring his first touchdown ever on a fumble recovery as Ottawa won their fifth Grey Cup 16-6. In 1961, Hamilton and Winnipeg were back at the big show as the Grey Cup was again played at Toronto's Exhibition Stadium. The 1961 Grey Cup goes into the record book as the only game settled in overtime as the Ticats and Bombers were deadlocked at 14 at the end of regulation time. With no scoring in the first overtime period, the Bombers threatened as quarterback Kenny Plone looked for a receiver. With everyone covered, he took off on an 18-yard run into the end zone. With the convert, Winnipeg won 21-14. It was their record 21st consecutive road win, a record that still stands today. If the two teams thought the 1961 Grey Cup was a long one, it didn't even compare to what faced the Bombers and Ticats when they returned to Exhibition Stadium the following year for the rematch. It may have been the best Grey Cup no one ever saw because it was a weird uh, a game between, uh, again, between Winnipeg and Hamilton, who staged some absolutely wonderful games. The 58 game we've already mentioned in 61, they played again. The game went into overtime, the first and only overtime game in the Grey Cup. Winnipeg won it again. And in 62, they came back at it again. And of course, the game had to be halted with uh, 10 minutes to play uh, because of fog. You could eventually you couldn't see anything. In the early part of the game, the people at ground level were able to see the game, but to, from the press box where I sat, it, occasionally you just see somebody come in out of the fog. A brilliant play. The 62 game didn't finish until nearly 25 hours after opening kickoff. In the fourth quarter, the two teams were sent to their dressing rooms. Commissioner G. Sidney Halter elected to postpone the rest of the game until the next day with Winnipeg leading 28-27. They finished the game Sunday with no change in score. It was Winnipeg's seventh Grey Cup. They'd wait for over 20 years to win their next. Hamilton returned to the Grey Cup in 1963, but for a change, the opposition was the BC Lions, playing on their own turf at Empire Stadium. It was BC's first appearance in the Grey Cup since joining the CFL in 1954, and the Lions were led on offense by Willie the Wisp Fleming, who was brought down by a Hamilton tackle in the second quarter. Just as Fleming was going down, legendary tie cat badman Angelo Mosca came roaring across the field, launched himself at Fleming as the whistle went. The cat call said Mosca was a cheap shot artist for his late hit, but replays and the officials disagreed, saying that Mosca had been committed to the tackle. Fleming was helped from the field, no penalty was called, and Mosca became a Grey Cup legend due to the controversy. On the scoreboard, Hamilton won 21-10 in a game that saw receiver Hal Patterson score a touchdown on a 70-yard play. It was the fifth of his career, a Grey Cup record. The victory was the first for Patterson after five unsuccessful tries with Montreal and Hamilton. 
1964 saw the Lions return to the Grey Cup at Exhibition Stadium, where they reversed their fortunes against Hamilton with a 34-24 triumph and secured their first Grey Cup ever. The 1964 game was the last for Hamilton quarterback Bernie Filoni, who played in a total of eight and set a record with eight career touchdown passes. The Ticats made their fifth consecutive Grey Cup appearance in 1965 against, who else? The Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It was their fifth Grey Cup matchup in only eight years. And just like their last showdown with the Bombers, the weather at Exhibition Stadium was a factor in this game. This time, it wasn't fog, but winds gusting up to 80 kilometers an hour. Hunts had trouble clearing the line of scrimmage, and three times, Bud Grant ordered his players to concede two-point safeties so Winnipeg could get the ball back on its own 25. Ironically, Hamilton won the game by six points, the equivalent of the three two-point safeties. Hamilton may have won the contest 22-16, but their string of five straight trips to the Grey Cup ended in 1965. The Ticats domination of the Grey Cup ended due in large part to the rise of two new stars in the CFL. Ron Lancaster had been traded to the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and would go head to head against former teammate Ottawa's Russ Jackson. Since 1923, Saskatchewan teams have been to the Grey Cup eight times and each time had come away empty handed. Most believe the Green Riders would be shut out for a ninth time as the Ottawa Rough Riders were heavily favored going in. Yet Saskatchewan held Ottawa to a 14-14 tie at halftime before current Edmonton GM Hugh Campbell snared a five-yard touchdown pass from Lancaster. George Reed, the CFL's all-time leading rusher, went 31 yards for another touchdown. And current Saskatchewan GM Alan Ford added a single to round out the score. After a 43-year wait, Saskatchewan had its first Grey Cup. Lancaster 29, Jackson 14. The city of Ottawa hosted the Grey Cup in Canada's centennial year as the Western champion Rough Riders met the Eastern champion Ticats in Hamilton's sixth appearance of the 60s. Riding on their trademark defense, the Ticats hadn't allowed a touchdown in their previous five games. This incredible defensive stand continued in the 1967 Grey Cup as the Cats defeated Saskatchewan 24-1. After losing in 1966 and watching two other teams compete on their home turf in 67, Ottawa returned to the Grey Cup in 1968 at Exhibition Stadium and this time made it count. But not without worrying their fans as Calgary held a 14-4 halftime lead. Ottawa seemed to have fate on its side in the second half. Vic Washington juggling a pitch from Russ Jackson dropped the ball and had it bounce right back into his hands before taking off on an 80-yard touchdown run. Jackson also hit Margene Adkins for a 70-yard pass and run touchdown, and the Rough Riders went on to win 24-21. 1968 launched Ottawa on a roll right into the 1969 Grey Cup at the Autostad in Montreal, where the Riders would face Saskatchewan in a rematch of the 1966 championship. This time, however, the result was different, as Jackson put on an unforgettable performance in his final game. Lancaster got the Green Riders on the board first, throwing to Ford for a touchdown before a safety made it 9-0 for Saskatchewan. But then Jackson went to work, throwing a record four touchdown passes, a couple being gut reactions to Saskatchewan defensive charges. Two of those quick-thinking throws went to running back Ron Stewart as Ottawa went on to win 29-11. Jackson was named most valuable player of the game to end a career that included three CFL Most Outstanding Player Awards, four Outstanding Canadian Trophies, and three berths on CFL All-Star Team. With the arrival of a new decade came new faces and new teams. The Montreal Alouettes hadn't been in the Grey Cup since 1956 when they lost to Edmonton. They hadn't won the Cup since 1949. But these were the new Alouettes, with a new general manager in Red O'Quinn and a new coach in Sam Echeverry. Both had been mainstays of the Alouettes of the 50s. For only the second time ever, fans would see a matchup between Calgary and Montreal. It was Calgary who took an early lead with a touchdown, but Montreal came right back when it appeared that Moses Denson had been stopped, but instead threw a touchdown pass to Ted Alflin before the whistle went. Alouette quarterback Sonny Wade fought sub-zero temperatures and gale force winds 
to secure his place in the Grey Cup history book by winning the Grey Cup's Most Valuable Player Award. Final score, Montreal 23, Calgary 10. Remember the Toronto Grey Cup drought we mentioned earlier? Well, the Argos made it back to the Grey Cup in 1971 after 19 years without even an appearance. With exciting rookies like Joe Theismann and Leon McQuay in the lineup, Toronto was primed for a Grey Cup party. Standing in the way at Empire Stadium, however, were the Calgary Stampeders, a team that had been to the Grey Cup only a year earlier and finished first in the Western Division. Even with their star-studded lineup, it turned out to be a game in which the Argos just wouldn't get anything going offensively. After a Toronto interception by Dick Thornton late in the game, the Argos appeared destined to steal a victory with the ball on the Calgary 11. Leon McQuay took a handoff, cut up field and slipped on the wet turf. The ball squirted loose and Calgary's Reggie Holmes recovered. The Argos went on to lose their first Grey Cup after a record nine successive victories in their previous appearances in the East-West Classic. Calgary linebacker Wayne Harris became the first defensive player to ever win the Grey Cup MVP award after a standout effort in a 14-11 Stampeder win. With artificial turf and the opening of the new Canadian Football Hall of Fame, it was only appropriate that the city of Hamilton host the 1972 Grey Cup. And as fate would have it, the hometown favorites made it to the big show. The Ticats were led by Rookie of the Year quarterback Chuck Ely and receivers Tony Gabriel and Garney Henley. They faced great Saskatchewan veterans Ron Lancaster and George Reed. But when the clock wound down to 13 seconds left in the game, Hamilton called on 18-year-old Ian Sutter to boot the winner. And he did just that with a field goal to lock a 13-10 victory. In 1973, a new-look Ottawa team made its eighth appearance in the Grey Cup, facing the Edmonton Eskimos. The job that Russ Jackson once held was now in the hands of Rick Casada, and he combined with Rome Nixon on a 38-yard play to offset an earlier Edmonton touchdown by Roy Bell that had also covered 38 yards. A Jim Evanson touchdown completed an Ottawa comeback in the 22-18 victory. Edmonton would lose again in 1974 at Empire Stadium as Montreal's Don Sweet kicked a record four field goals, a convert, and a single point in a 20-7 Alouette win. There's two situations of Grey Cup memories that I have. The first is 1974. It rained seven days in a row. We played at Empire Stadium in uh, Vancouver. We beat uh, Edmonton 20 to, to 14 and the, the biggest thing I remember about that game was uh, being a relatively young player I started in 1972 was um, the mystique and the magic of the week uh, I can honestly tell you that I can't remember anything about the game I was so excited until the game ended we were all sitting in the locker room after the game and suddenly we were great cup champions it was like a dream while disappointing, two losses in two years didn't stop the Eskimos from making a third straight trip in 1975. The Eskimos were just beginning to roll through a period of 10 years in which they'd make nine Grey Cup appearances. Their first successful trip occurred at Calgary's McMahon Stadium, and it was the kicking game that again made the difference as it had in 1974. This time it was Dave Cutler who booted three field goals to account for all of the Eskimos scoring to capture the 1975 Grey Cup. An entire country held its breath as Montreal missed a last minute field goal to allow Edmonton to narrowly escape with a nine to eight victory. The first Grey Cup in 30 years where all the points were scored by Canadian players only. 1976 would interrupt the Eskimos and Alouettes Grey Cup rivalry as the Eastern and Western Rough Riders squared off against one another at Exhibition Stadium. Bill Hattonakis scooted 79 yards on an Ottawa punt return, but the biggest play of the game was saved for the final 20 seconds. Tom Clemens hit tight end Tony Gabriel to secure a 23-20 triumph for the Eastern Riders, ruining Lancaster's last Grey Cup appearance. A record crowd of 68,205 packed Olympic Stadium in Montreal to watch the hometown Alouettes take on the Eskimos in 1977. Grey Cup history already included mud, fog, and wind, but this one became known as the Ice Bowl, as snow in Montreal froze on the field in the days before Olympic Stadium had a roof. The hometown side dealt with this slippery footing by applying a staple gun to their shoes for better traction. 
interesting part of that game was we had great traction because we found a way of running on the field with staples in our shoes and uh, no one knew until after the game that we were uh, running on studded tires. With that advantage and a hot Don Sweet, the Alouette soared to a 41-6 win over Edmonton in a game that saw Sweet boot six field goals, three converts, and two singles for 23 points on the day to set a Grey Cup individual scoring record. The victory proved to be a worthy farewell for head coach Marv Levy, who took his two Grey Cup rings and moved on to coach the NFL's Kansas City Chiefs. The 1978 season saw the Edmonton Eskimos emerge as a true sports dynasty. Slot back Tom Scott was brought in from the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and the Eskimos signed an impressive quarterback out of Washington State named Warren Moon. Both players would become important cogs in the Eskimos' renowned twin slot back offense. Moon would begin his CFL career as an understudy to veteran Tom Wilkinson, but became a mainstay by the end of Edmonton's five-year reign as Grey Cup champion. With Cutler handling the place-kicking chores, and with the Alberta crew defense led by stalwarts like Dan Kepley and Dave Dr. Death Fennell, the Eskimos triumphed over each of the four Eastern teams in successive Grey Cups from 1979 to 82. The Eskimos began with their old nemesis, the Alouettes, with 20 to 13 and 17 to nine triumphs over Montreal in 1978 and in 1979, before romping to a convincing 48 to 10 win against the Hamilton Tiger Cats in Toronto, a game that saw Scott score a record three touchdowns and Moon win the Offensive Star of the Game Award. While the win over Hamilton in 1980 was lopsided, the Eskimos would face their biggest Grey Cup challenge just one year later at Olympic Stadium. Edmonton had lost just one game in 1981 and was scoring an average of 36 points a game in their quest to become the first team to win four straight Grey Cups. The team standing in Edmonton's way when the 1981 Grey Cup game kicked off at Olympic Stadium was one that sputtered to just five wins all year. It was widely assumed that Edmonton would easily crush the Ottawa Rough Riders to win their fourth consecutive Grey Cup. Yet by halftime, Ottawa led 20 to one with quarterback J.C. Watts, now a U.S. congressman, leading the attack that produced touchdowns from Jim Reed and Sam Platt and two converts and two field goals from Jerry Organ. Edmonton could only muster a single point from Dave Cutler, and the Eskimos continued to stumble through the third quarter until Jim Germany and Moon struck for touchdown. In the fourth, Oregon kicked another field goal to give the Riders a 23-15 lead, but the Eskimos drove downfield and Moon scored to narrow the difference to two points. In a bid to tie the score, Edmonton elected to go for a two-point convert and got it when Moon connected with Marco Sincar. With the streak on the line and three seconds in the game, Cutler lined up a 27-yard field goal and, as he had so often in the past, split the uprights to clinch the victory. It was the greatest comeback in Grey Cup history. So impressive was Ottawa's gutsy performance that two Rough Riders, Watts and linebacker John Glassford, were named Offensive and Defensive Players of the Game, while the Canadian award went to Eskimo running back Neil Lumsden. Only one Eastern Division team had failed to meet Edmonton during its four-year reign, but that all changed when the Toronto Argonauts rebounded from a 4-11 and season in 81 to finish first in the East in 82. It had been 30 years since Toronto last won the Grey Cup and 11 years since they'd been to the big game. Bob Bilovich was the new head coach and the new run and shoot offense was creating damage all over the CFL with quarterback Condridge Holloway connecting with the likes of receiver Terry Greer. All of Toronto was on hand for the party with the game held at Exhibition Stadium. Cutler put Edmonton on the board with a field goal, but Toronto turned a short pass from Condridge Holloway to Emmanuel Tolbert into an 84-yard touchdown run. Greer and Edmonton's Brian Kelly traded touchdowns, but Kelly combined with Moon for a 41-yarder to put the Eskimos ahead to stay. Lumsden would add another TD in the eventual 32-16 Edmonton win. With five straight championships, Edmonton rightfully deserved the nickname City of Champions. Poor old Toronto had gone empty-handed for 31 years as the 1983 preparations for the first indoor Grey Cup 
got underway at the newly opened BC Place in Vancouver. It was a, a game that uh, the, uh, the Lions dominated the first half, and uh, then uh, Bob Abilovich coaching the Argos then. He took out Conridge Holloway as starter, put in Joe Barnes, which he, they did quite often in those days. Barnes was a very good relief pitcher, came in, and he uh, passed the Argonauts to the to a win. It was not a, uh, they only won, I think, by one point, but uh, they won the game. The Lions led 17-12 in the fourth quarter, but a series of passes from relief quarterback Joe Barnes to Emmanuel Tolbert and Paul Pearson drove the Argos into scoring position. Barnes found an open Cedric Minter in the end zone to give Toronto an 18-17 lead. The Argos tried to stretch that difference to a field goal, but they failed on a two-point convert attempt. A city that still remembered McQuay's fumble of 71 anxiously sat on the edge of their chairs for the remaining two and a half minutes. Barnes rolls out, and the seven-yard run gives Argos a valuable first down. And the Argos were Grey Cup champs for the first time since 1952. Toronto, you waited a long time. Here it is. You got it. While Toronto celebrated their long-awaited victory in the downtown core, at least one Argo was used to being a champion. Hank Elissick, a punter with the Eskimos during their five-year reign, had joined Toronto in time for their Grey Cup win. He is the only player to win six straight well, Grey Cups. Like the Argos, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers had waited 19 years for a return to the Grey Cup, and 1984 marked 22 years since their last championship. That victory had come in the Fog Bowl of 1962, in the middle of the fierce Winnipeg-Hamilton rivalry of the late 50s and early 60s. Now, more than two decades later, it was their old nemesis, the Hamilton Ticats, who once again stood between the Bombers and the Grey Cup. With ex Cat Tom Clemens at the controls and CFL rushing king Willard Reeves handling the ground game, the Bombers were overwhelming favorites to return to the top of the hill. Their old rival began haunting Winnipeg immediately as former Blue Bomber quarterback Dieter Brock ran for a Hamilton touchdown and passed for another to Rocky DiPietro. But Winnipeg went to work in the second quarter with 27 straight points. While Reeves was a contributing factor to a strong ground game, Sean Kehoe did some damage of his own with 89 yards on 12 carries. Cal Murphy, who still coaches the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, had his first Grey Cup as a head coach after serving as an assistant with the Eskimos during their record run. The 1980s became a decade in which several Grey Cup droughts came to an end. The BC Lions hadn't won since 1964 against Hamilton. And the Ticats were the opposition once again for the 1985 Grey Cup. Hurting the Lions' cause was the fact that wide receiver Swervin Mervin Fernandez, the CFL's most outstanding player in the regular season, and Keevan Jenkins, the team's leading rusher, were both injured. But their replacements didn't miss a beat, as Freddie Sims ran for 98 yards, and Ned Armour finished with 151 receiving yards, including 84 and 59-yard TD strikes from quarterback Roy DeWalt, who chalked up close to 400 yards in passing. In the second quarter, Hamilton overcame a 13-point deficit, scoring two touchdowns to take a 14-13 lead, and with momentum on their side, forced the Lions into a punting situation. This set the stage for the play of the game. Kicking from his own side of the field, Louis Pisaglia saw Hamilton's Mitchell Price charging to block the kick. Stepping aside, he took off for 13 yards and a first down on the BC 51. DeWalt took over, fired a strike to armor in the eventual 37-24 victory. It wouldn't be the last time that Pisaglia would make a critical Grey Cup play. The Ticats had been to the Grey Cup three times in the 80s with nothing to show for it. The last time they'd won was 1972, 14 years earlier. During that earlier era, Hamilton's trademark was defense, led by the likes of Angelo Mosca, John Barrow, and Garney Henley. But the 1986 defensive crew, featuring Rush N. Grover Covington, linebacker Ben Zambiazzi, and defensive back Paul Bennett wasn't too shabby either. The defense rose to the occasion, sacking Edmonton Eskimo quarterbacks 10 times. Hamilton forced 10 turnovers, including six fumbles, two interceptions, and two more on failed third-down gambles. 
Offensively, Paul Osbaldiston contributed 21 points, tying a record with six field goals as Hamilton won 39-15. The next three Grey Cups were won by different teams, but they all had something in common. All were decided by late field goals. In 1987, it was Edmonton's Jerry Corrick putting the boots to Toronto with 45 seconds left in a game that featured Gizmo Williams' record 115-yard return of a missed field goal for a touchdown. Gizmo has a block in the sidelines. He has not stepped out. He may go all the way. He needs one block, and he'll do it easily. He may not need the block. Henry Gizmo Williams... The Eskimos won their fourth Grey Cup of the decade, 38 to 36. With just under three minutes left in the 1988 contest, it was Trevor Kennard deciding the issue with a 30-yarder for Winnipeg in a 22-21 win over BC. While both the 87 and 88 Grey Cups were won by teams that had been champions earlier in the decade, the 1989 contest at Toronto's new Sky Dome was a different story. The Green Riders were back after a regular season that saw them finish with a 500 record. The Ticats, on the other hand, were 12-6-0 in the Eastern Division. In a seesaw battle, Hamilton's Tony Champion squirmed, turned, and grabbed the touchdown pass late in the game to tie the score at 40. Saskatchewan engineered a drive downfield in the final minute and called on the guy they called Robo-Kicker to decide the issue. Dave Ridgway nailed a 35-yard field goal to secure the Green Riders' first Grey Cup in 23 years. Some say the 1958 contest between Hamilton and Winnipeg was the best Grey Cup game ever played, but they might get an argument from the millions who tuned in to the 87 or 89 classics. While each of those games had featured offensive fireworks, the 1990 clash between Winnipeg and Edmonton is remembered for the defensive play of linebacker Greg Battle, who chipped in with a pair of interceptions, one for a touchdown in the Bombers' convincing 50-11 victory. The Argos and Stampeders were back in the 1991 Grey Cup, as Winnipeg hosted the Classic for the first time ever. When the Argos left Toronto, it was widely assumed that Ricky Foggy was going to be the starting quarterback, as he had been since replacing Matt Dunnigan, who was out with a shoulder injury. But the night before the game, Dunnigan started throwing footballs in a hotel ballroom and decided that with some freezing to his shoulder, he could start. With minus 17 Celsius temperatures, he might not have needed the freezing, but Dunnigan came out and led the Argos to a 36-21 victory over the Calgary Stampeders. Dunnigan had been to three Grey Cups and was on the losing side twice. In his one victory with Edmonton in 1987, he had been replaced by Damon Allen, who went on to win Offensive Star of the Game. This time, Dunnigan went the distance, and his presence had a positive effect on his teammates. Rahib Rocket Ismail turned the game in the Argos' favor with a record 87-yard kickoff return for a touchdown. Ironically, Dunnigan returned to the Grey Cup in 1992, only this time as the starter for Winnipeg. He led his Bombers against the Stampeders, who were back for a second consecutive shot at the Cup. The Stamps had their own Grey Cup drought happening. It had been 21 years since Calgary had won the Cup by beating Toronto in 1971. But this would be the year of a rising new star in the CFL, Calgary's quarterback, Heisman Trophy winner, Doug Flutie. Flutie completed 33 of 49 passes for 480 yards and two touchdowns in the Stamps' 24-10 win. Flutie was named Most Valuable Player, while Dave Sapungis, who caught one of his touchdown passes, was named Most Valuable Canadian for the second straight year. When the 1993 Grey Cup moved to McMahon Stadium in Calgary, the expected presence of the powerful Stampeders whipped the city of Calgary into a frenzy of anticipation. But their Alberta arch rivals, the Edmonton Eskimos, ruined the party by defeating Calgary in the Western Final before going on to meet Winnipeg in the Grey Cup. Special teams, the story in this championship, as Edmonton took advantage of several turnovers and kicker Sean Fleming booted six field goals to tie a record jointly owned by Paul Osbaldiston and Don Sweet. A kicker made the difference again in 1994 as Louis Pisaglia returned to his form of 1985 and played a critical role for the BC Lions. 
The Grey Cup was played at BC Place, and the Lions were expected to be in the stands rather than on the turf after finishing third in the Western Division. But in the Western Finals, younger brother Darren Flutie snared a touchdown pass on the final play of the game to sink brother Doug and the heavily favored stamps. Would the upsets continue in the Grey Cup? And the so week leading Vancouver. up to the game was a flag-waving bonanza. First-year franchise Baltimore became the first American team to ever play in the Grey Cup, turning the Classic into an international border war. It was Canada versus the United States, and the Americans took the upper hand, taking a 20-10 lead. A fake field goal attempt set up a BC touchdown by quarterback Danny McManus before a Pasaglia field goal tied it up. Unlike 1985, when Pisaglia slipped out of a tough jam and ran for the first down, he was called upon to do what he does best and booted a 38-yarder with no time showing on the clock. The kick gave BC a 23-20 win in the first international Grey Cup, keeping the coveted Grey Cup trophy in Canadian hands and closing another chapter in the Grey Cup legend book. For the first time ever, the Grey Cup would be played in Regina, and preparations were already underway for the 83rd showdown for Lord Earl Grey silverware. Saskatchewan fans gave early notice of what to expect when 55,000 jammed into temporary stands at Taylor Field to watch the hometown Riders hand Calgary one of its two losses in 1995. But that was just one highlight along the road. While organizers prepared for the Grey Cup in Regina, the CFL took on an entirely different look in 95. With the addition of the Birmingham Barracudas and Memphis Mad Dogs, the possibility of another international showdown for the Grey Cup was greatly enhanced when the CFL abandoned its traditional east-west format and went for a north-south alignment. Joining the Mad Dogs and Cudas in the Southern Division were the San Antonio Texans, who had transferred to the Alamo Dome from Sacramento, and the holdover Baltimore Stallions and the Shreveport Pirates. The playoff format saw the top five teams from the Northern Division qualify, the fifth club crossing over to the Southern Division to play the first place finisher there. As the 95 campaign began, the optimism of all teams was extremely high, as many teams seemed to have a legitimate chance of grabbing the big prize. A lot of, a lot of positives about it, certainly Birmingham being the biggest the fans there, how smart they are, how football conscious they are, um, the food, the weather, you know, the less taxes, you know, all those type of things, you know, great facility, you know, great owner, um, just everything's falling into place, looking forward to the opportunity, and uh, thank God we've got one. People make a mistake by thinking this is a game from Mars, it's not. It's, uh, it's football, you still have to block, tackle, and run with the football, throw and catch, and do the same things you do in any game to win. We're going to prepare our team the best we can, concentrate on how we play, and if, I think if we do that, we'll be fine. Calgary was once again favored to win the Grey Cup, and the Stampeders didn't disappoint. But something was different than in previous years. Leading their attack in the second half of the season was a new face, as four-time CFL Most Outstanding player Doug Flutie had suffered an elbow injury and was sidelined until the end of the season. His understudy, Jeff Garcia, moved in, and Calgary didn't miss a beat despite the absence of their star quarterback. With Garcia at the controls, Calgary lost just one game, and the Stampeders tied Baltimore for the best record in the league. While the Stampeders had the most productive offense in the league, their Alberta rivals, the Edmonton Eskimos, used an entirely different means to lock up second place in the North. With the CFL's stingiest defense, the Eskimos allowed just 359 points against as they finished with a 13-5 record. On offense, the Eskimos had to count on Kerwin Bell after the departure of Damon Allen to Memphis. But the newcomer made good use of another fresh face in Shalon Baker, a 1,000-yard receiver and Rookie of the Year candidate. The defending Grey Cup champion BC Lions fell to third place in the North, a position they occupied in 1994 before upsetting Edmonton, Calgary, and finally Baltimore to win the Cup. The Lions traded quarterback Kent Austin to the Toronto Argonauts in the offseason making room for Danny McManus to move into the starter's role. 
To add to the air game, Corey Philpott rushed for just over 1,300 yards and set a single-season CFL record for touchdowns with 22. In Hamilton, quarterback Steve Taylor and Anthony Cavillo used a wily veteran Wiley veteran to the max as Earl Winfield finished third in league receiving with nearly 1,500 yards as the Ticats finished fourth. With Hamilton scheduled to play Calgary and BC up against Edmonton in the first round, the fifth place team would cross over to the south to square off against Baltimore. Who that would be wasn't decided until the final weekend of the season. Both the Saskatchewan Rough Riders and Winnipeg Blue Bombers went into their last games with identical 6 and 11 records. But Saskatchewan lost 30 25 to BC the day before the Blue Bombers defeated the Ottawa Rough Riders in Winnipeg. The Toronto Argonauts were expected to challenge Calgary for top spot in the Northern Division thanks to their vaunted bomb squad offense. Kent Austin was brought in from the Grey Cup champion Lions to lead an attack that featured Jeff Fairholm, Paul Mazzotti, and Mike Pinball Clemens. All had been All-Stars or award winners during their careers. But the bomb squad failed to put the numbers on the board. And at midseason, rookie head coach Mike Farragelli was fired and replaced by general manager Bob Obilovich, the man who led Toronto to the 1983 Grey Cup. Still, the offense sputtered. And while the air attack was grounded, the Argos did have a jet working in their favor. Jimmy the Jet Cunningham offered hope for 1995, along with Clemens, who led the league in combined yards. But limited to just a threatening ground attack, the Argos finished out of the playoffs. It was also a season of disappointment for the Ottawa Roughriders, who lost veteran quarterback Danny Barrett to injury early in the season. In the South Division, Baltimore used many of the tools that built a Grey Cup finalist in 1994. With Tracy Hammett quarterback, Mike Pringle ran for 1,791 yards to win his second straight CFL rushing title, behind the likes of Mike Whittacombe and Shar Pordanish. Ham had the explosive Chris Armstrong at his disposal, and Armstrong didn't disappoint, finishing with over 1,100 yards in receiving. When the Sacramento Gold Miners moved into the San Antonio Alamo Dome and changed their name to the Texans, their fortunes changed too. Quarterback David Archer, who spent his first two CFL seasons in Sacramento, continued the aerial attacks that he displayed with the gold miners. Archer completed just over 61% of his passes, but used an enviable running game to balance the attack. The Texans had a solid one-two punch with the versatile Mike Saunders and powerful back Troy Mills. The CFL's leading scorer, Roman Anderson, booted 235 points, and the Texans earned their first playoff spot in franchise history with a second-place finish. The Birmingham Barracudas earned their first playoff berth as well, edging Memphis for the third and final spot. Another player from an expansion team sat on top of a defensive statistic as Mad Dog Tim Colfield led the league in sacks with 24 to earn his second consecutive nomination as CFL Outstanding Defensive Player. A loss to Edmonton on the final weekend of the season eliminated the Mad Dogs, who were just two points back of the Cudas and eight ahead of the 5-13 and 13 Shreveport Pirates. So the final playoff matchups saw Calgary play Hamilton, Edmonton against BC, Winnipeg traveling to Baltimore, and the Barracudas facing the Texans. When the playoffs opened, Baltimore put its intimidating running attack to good use as Pringle ran for 211 yards and a pair of touchdowns in a 36-21 win over Winnipeg in one South semifinal. Despite two touchdowns from Gerald Wilcox, the Blue Bombers missed the division final for the first time since 1987. The game saw quarterback Reggie Slack attempt a record 51 passes compared to 19 for his Baltimore counterpart, Tracy Hand. In the other South semi, the Texans scored 31 points off turnovers to register a convincing 52-9 win over Birmingham. San Antonio's seven TDs tied a playoff record 
as the Texans picked off four Barracuda passes in the game that set up the South Final against Baltimore the following week. In the North, the Battle of Alberta was set as Calgary counted on its defense to pull out a 30-13 win over Hamilton. Marvin Coleman returned interceptions 95 and 56 yards for touchdown. The Tiger Cats led 10-6 at the half, but Calgary exploded for 24 points in the fourth quarter to secure the victory. Like Baltimore, the Stampeders put their running game to good use as Tony Stewart finished the game with 113 yards and a touchdown. The Edmonton Eskimos did their part in setting up the legendary provincial battle in the Western Final by beating the defending Grey Cup champion BC Lions 26-15. The Eskimos used the same weapon deployed in the 1993 Grey Cup as Sean Fleming booted six field goals to tie a playoff record. The North Final, about to be played at Calgary's McMahon Stadium, marked the fifth time in six years that the Stampeders and Eskimos would meet for a division championship. In the end, it was as it should be. The two best teams squaring off for the Grey Cup as Calgary ended two years of playoff disappointment with a 37-4 win over Edmonton in the North Final at McMahon Stadium. Doug Flutie overcame his four interceptions and completed 21 of 30 passes for 261 yards and one touchdown. As he had a week earlier, Calgary running back Tony Stewart had a big impact, rushing for 82 yards and scoring two touchdowns. Edmonton's defense was expected to give the Stamps a rough time, but in the end, it was the Calgary unit recording three sacks, forcing four turnovers and allowing just 119 yards of offense from Edmonton. Dave Sapunja scored the other Stampeder touchdown, while Mark McLaughlin booted five field goals and three converts. But down in Baltimore, Carlos Huerta was not to be outdone in the kicking department. Huerta booted a playoff record seven field goals to account for all of the Stallion scoring against San Antonio. As he had so often, Mike Pringle used his skills to set up those kicks, rushing for 136 yards, while Tracy Ham chipped in with 72. Baltimore earned its second straight ticket to the Grey Cup with a 21-11 win over San Antonio. Would the Baltimore running game be the difference in the cold environment of Saskatchewan? Or would Calgary win the championship that had been denied them ever since their last win in 1992? Those questions would be answered a week later at Taylor Field. Grey Cup week in Regina, the biggest party of the year, and the setting for a north-south battle that would go down in the record books. Over 100,000 fans swelled into the small prairie town to be a part of Grey Cup history and to have the time of their lives. To the loyal throng, this wasn't Calgary versus Baltimore. It was Canada against the U.S., us versus them. For the players, it was the culmination of a hard-fought season and a chance to attain a goal that every player dreams of. You know, this is what you work for in the offseason. This is what drives you when there's no one else around, the lights are not on you, and when you have to, you know, the, the sweat and the, the cramps and all those things. This is why you do that, and, now, and you appreciate why you do it when you get an opportunity to play a championship game. Um, I took a picture with it last night, so I'm bringing it home with me. <laughs> um, it, it, it's, it's something that's special. This, this is what you work for all off season, um, and this is what you go through all the BS um, throughout training camp and, and all the heartaches th throughout the season. You know, this is what you work for, and we've been blessed enough to make it back for a second year in a row, and hopefully we, we will come out with a victory and be able to take it home wherever home may be for us. You know, as far as we're concerned, we're really representing Calgary. We've been fighting all year to to put ourselves on top of our division and all that, and the Calgary fans have supported us. However, this is a situation where all of Canada can, can get behind us and enjoy it and, and really have somebody to root for. And it has become a little bit of a U.S.-Canada thing, in, in, I'd say north of the border. And uh, it's a great feeling knowing that, that people that usually are rooting against us are a little bit on our side this time. We've, we've achieved quite a bit over a three-year period, and uh, this franchise has actually been to three Grey Cups in five years. So uh, there's nothing left to prove. This is for us to go out and try to win, and uh, it's, it's for the guys in the locker room. 
on the 30th anniversary of the Win Bowl in Toronto, stinging prairie gusts blew into Taylor Field, tilting the pregame edge to Baltimore with its strong running game. But it was the special teams that drew first blood. The Stallions were three up, three down in stopping the Stampeders on their first possession. And when Calgary punted, Chris Wright shot up the middle for a record 82-yard return for a touchdown. Calgary came right back with two Mark McLaughlin field goals before the first quarter ended. Early in the second, the Stampeder defense chipped in with some points as Will Johnson grabbed a loose ball and rambled 35 yards to the Baltimore three. On the next play, Calgary moved Marvin Big Daddy Pope from rush end to receiver, and he connected with Flutie to give Calgary a 13-7 lead. Carlos Huerta kicked his first of five field goals for the Stallions before Alfred Payton blocked a Tony Martino punt, and Alvin Walton recovered for a touchdown. Suddenly, the Stallions were ahead, 17-13, a lead they would never relinquish. Huerta added a couple more field goals, including a record 53-yarder to take a 23-13 lead at halftime. After Baltimore punter Josh Miller scored a single, Flutie took the Stampeders downfield on an 11-play, 75-yard drive and took it in from the one to narrow the score to 24-20. While the Baltimore special teams handled the first half scoring, the offense struck with a touchdown when Ham scampered 13 yards to cap off a 92-yard drive. The Stallions were in control, and Huerta added a couple of more field goals to salt it away. While Baltimore was hailed before the Grey Cup for its running game, it's interesting to note that the Stallions actually presented a balanced attack. With 213 yards in the air, 150 along the ground, and special teams making up the difference, the Stallions scored a decisive victory and opened a new chapter in the storied history of the Grey Cup, a story that will be continued in Hamilton in 1996. Went over 100 yards? I believe so. Uh, <laughs> I, I was not aware of that. I was not aware of that, but... um. Anything they want, you know, they, they can get from me. If, it's, if it costs me dinner, um, I, I'll buy them dinner. Well, you know, our motto this year was unfinished business, and it certainly was a year of unfinished business. Anything we've said all year, anything less than a Grey Cup championship would be disappointing. Um, but you have to take necessary steps to become a champion, and, and I felt that we did as a ball club. You know, Tracy Ham's preparation going into the game and Steve Barato, the offensive coordinator, and all the people that put together that plan and then executed and called by Tracy Ham. You know, he goes, it goes uh, uh, unnoticed a lot, just exactly not only his play, but what his calling of the game. He called a great game and uh, kept everybody guessing and, and executed the game plan. Watkins, he busts into the clear. The Rough Riders can smell Pater. On the 